so this brings up the, the idea of what we call time dilation, or, or more, more specifically, whatever you're evaluating as your time interval in one reference frame may not necessarily be the same as a time interval in some other frame. So our time intervals now no longer are conserved from one frame to another. Or the way that, the, the way that we properly said, it, time intervals are no longer invariants. When you go from one frame to another, time varies, so you can't have what we call an invariant quantity. And we'll return to that later because that's a really important idea, invariant quantities. I want to make one more, one more important distinction here. One of these two reference frames is really unique. The Earth observer is seeing some spaceship go by at a certain speed. Now, if you had some other observer on some other planet that watched that spaceship go by, they might see that spaceship go by at some other speed. Neither of those two measured speeds is any more better than the other. But if you're in the spaceship, how fast would you say the spaceship is going? Zero. The way I think of it more precisely is if you have a clock attached to that spaceship. So here's our spaceship again. And we have some huge, you know, um, a huge flavor flav clock here. So here's our, our big gigantic clock attached to our spaceship. And now if the spaceship is whizzing by at a velocity of V, the rate that someone here on Earth would be seeing that moving clock go is not going to be the same as his moving clock down here. His clock is going to go at a different rate than that. Or more specifically, delta TEs are not going to match delta TSs. Now, we'll talk a little bit about, based on what that gamma factor has to be, which of those two have to be greater. But for the time being, as long as we say they're going to be separate, I want to make a little bit of a different notation here. Because the guy within the moving spaceship here, so the guy within the spaceship is the only person in the universe who will see his clock at rest. I mean, maybe not. The, if there's other people in the spaceship, they would all agree with that statement, I guess. But the moving frame of the spaceship is the only reference frame in the universe where this clock is not moving relative to the origin of that frame. Any other observer that sees the spaceship going by will see a non-zero velocity. So they're going to have a distinctly different view. And for that reason, this observer here, the spaceship observer, is what we call the rest frame observer. We call it the rest frame. So we see things in our own reference frame at rest relative to us. And turns out that what you measure in that reference frame is a unique point of view in the universe. No other observers in the universe are going to measure quite the same thing that you do. And what you measure is actually really important. Because turns out that, um, and the reason for that, th this is, is getting a little bit higher um, level, but turns out that no matter who you are in the universe, if you see something going by at a certain speed, you can always calculate what, what, those, what the person in that spaceship would be predicting to see their clock run at. So if you're, if you're standing still on Earth, you can always convert your clock's rate into the rest frame rate for this spaceship here. And so instead of using delta TSS, I'm going to call this uh, delta tau. That's the typical convention that most relativity texts and papers use. So this is what we call our rest frame time interval, or rest time, uh, or whatever, our proper time, I'm sorry. Or in other words, proper time tau is exactly what is measured by an observer who does not see that clock moving. So that's the, the, essentially the definition. The proper time is how fast that spaceship observer sees the time going compared with everyone else. And there's a, a very fundamental property um, of that proper time as it relates to the time that everyone else would see it going. So to do that, let's take a look at how gamma works here for a second. I do want to talk just real quickly about what that gamma factor uh, relates to and how to actually calculate it. So again, as a reminder, we define, first of all, it makes things a lot simpler to define beta 
as V over C. And to be entirely clear by V, what I mean is how fast that entire reference frame is whooshing by some other observer. So it's the relative velocity between two reference frames. Um, that that will it will be important to distinguish that once we go into what we call co-moving or 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 frame dependent velocities. But that's what the V means right now. And then we define our gamma factor to be uh, one. You can write you can write the gamma the square root over the whole thing or algebraically the same. You write it as one over one plus beta squared or v squared over c squared or v over c squared. Now, if we think about it, um, by the way, and another thing, just to be entirely clear, we always treat this as a, as a positive value. We never worry about negative betas. All that means is that your X frame is pointed backwards towards your motion. So uh, we're always going to have beta as a positive value. So the, lo the lowest that beta could be is going to be what value? Obviously, zero. So zero is the baseline for beta. And then now we have beta here. And I don't quite want to get into why this is going to be true, but our velocity we're going to find can never actually reach C. We will derive that formally, but just take it on principle that this always has to be less than one. Uh, what did I do wrong on the board here? Uh, something fundamentally wrong. That's a super important mistake that I just made here. That's absolutely going to be a minus sign there. Um, and that's the, the, the mathematical reason, by the way, why beta can't equal one, because this blows up. This becomes a singular value, um, or well, inf infinite value it approaches, whatever. So that's, that's why we have a limiting factor. Now, what it doesn't prevent is, for example, beta being greater than one. Now, if beta was greater than one, what would that tell us about gamma? In that case, the, this is going to be a negative value there, meaning we have a negative square root, meaning uh, beta, uh, gamma is going to be imaginary. Let's not allow gamma to be imaginary, and that's why we can put our definitive less than one here. It mathematically blows up at one. Anything above that is imaginary. We know that typically imaginary values don't correspond to real solutions in the, in the world. Um, later on in your education, you're going to hear about something called imaginary time. We think it's a thing within black holes. That's all I'll say about that. So anyway, this gamma factor, sorry, the, the bottom side of this, if we look at 1 minus beta, the lowest the whole uh, numerator can be. If beta is 0, this just becomes 1. So the, if beta is 0, I'm going to make a bit of a table here. Oh, let's see. So this table is going to be beta and gamma. If beta is 0, the minimum, clearly gamma is 1. So in other words, if you have two reference frames that aren't moving relative to each other, there's not going to be a change in time. And that makes perfect sense. If one delta t is related to the other delta t by that gamma factor, and if gamma is 1, then the two time, the time intervals match. But let's consider anything else. If beta is greater than 0, what we're going to do is we're going to take 1 and subtract something from it. Now, again, we're never going to subtract more than one here if we have this constraint. But what's going to happen, though, is that this value becomes a little bit less than one. The square root of that becomes a little bit less than one as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to take one divided by something that's a little bit smaller than one. So in other words, if beta is not 0, then we're necessarily going to take one over something a little bit smaller than one, one over 0 0.9, one over 0 0.7. We're always going to get a value that's greater than one now. So gamma will always be equal to either zero if, if, it's, if we don't have any motion, or, and that's the dumb case, the uninteresting case, in every interesting case, our gamma factor will always be greater than one for any moving frames. 
So, and that's gonna be important now to analyze the next equation that we, that we develop here. You can always substitute something greater than one for gamma without knowing what it is and see how the results compare. And so I just wanna go through a couple of basic examples. Um, if, and, and I'm gonna allow you to do some more of this on a future problem set. But so just a couple of basic examples. If beta is point, and what value did I use? Um, 0 0.01 or 1% 1 the speed of light is your relative velocity. Our gamma factor, even at, and this is gonna be by the way, um, was it uh, 3 million miles per second? You know, it's an extremely fast velocity. But even something, you know, many orders of magnitude faster than we can currently go on Earth is still gonna find a gamma factor to be almost indistinguishable from one. It's gonna be 1. 0.00005. So let's say instead of going 1% the speed of light, we want to go 10% um, the speed of light. So we have a, a beta of 0.1. So it's almost undistinguishable still, but a little less so. So in this case here, at 10% the speed of light, the gamma factor is only a half or 0.5% or different, meaning your clocks would still run precisely the same to within a half a percent if you're going 10% to the speed of So you see how things really don't even begin to make any effect whatsoever until extremely, extremely high velocities. And this is where, you know, when we say special relativity deals with light near the speed of light, no, it deals with motion near the speed of light. We see that at everyday velocities, when we make these, when we make time dilation equations or any other equation that predicts motions, there's always going to be a gamma factor in there. And gamma is going to be basically one for every everyday motion that you're ever going to see. There's a lot of everys and everys in there. But if gamma is close to one, nothing substantial changes. We don't see any appreciable difference whatsoever until even at about half the speed of light. And here we now start to see it's 1.15. So we now have a 15% difference. So really, relativ relativistic motion doesn't reasonably start until we get to about this mark. Now, we can see I'm going to plug in two more values here. Let's go to 90%. And then now it kind of balloons out a little bit. We get 2.29. And then I'm going to put one more value in here, uh, 0.99. And we now have a factor of about 7.1, 7.09. In other words, what we're seeing is that this doesn't really seem to become an important thing until we get to at least even 90% the speed of light. You know, that's when the clocks begin to run twice as fast, for example, or when other weird effects happen that are like noticeably different. Now, in theory, if I were to like, you know, walk past someone sitting on a park bench, my, my beta would be something like 0.00000001 or something like that. In theory, I'm gonna have a gamma factor that's very slightly different than one. So they could, if they were watching my, my, my clock that's attached or what, if they were seeing my watch, I should say, um, they, my watch would actually run slightly differently than their watch because I have some motion relative to them. But that difference is literally going to be on the order of about 10 to the minus 15. There's no way you could measure any difference at these velocities. Um, so this is where we end up though with, with this gamma factor. It's always gonna be greater than one and the closer your velocity gets to, to the speed of light, the more of an effect these relativistic things have. Um, okay, so the, the last thing I want to talk about here is now tie everything together to talk about the proper time and how it really is a unique way of measuring time in the universe. And again, let's let's make our, um, our diagram up here and we see some clock on the wall now. And this person here is measuring how long it takes the clock to make one tick. Any guess how long they're going to say it takes the, the clock to make one tick? <laughs> A second, assuming their clock is uh, timed or you know calibrated correctly, they're going to see each second take one second, um, or or more precisely, they're going to see um, the delta tau. If they're if they're watching time tick by, they're going to measure one second on their clock as one point zero seconds. Now I say that because now we have some other observer that's on a nearby planet. It does not be Earth, so it might be some other speed that's going at. Um, we'll still call it V, though. And in this case here, what the, the equation that we previously had, and I'm going to write it using our previous subscripts. 
the delta T for Earth was going to be gamma times delta T on the spaceship. And now I'm going to change our, our notation a little bit because this delta T SS is exactly what we're now calling the proper time, delta tau. So let's just get rid of that. And now the, the, the nice, like, kind thing to do to students would be to, to continue calling this delta TE. So we always know which of the two is the, like, the, the, the thing that the dudes watching the spaceship uh, walk by or fly by. The way every textbook I've seen to do it uh, is we have a delta T and a delta tau. Now the problem becomes, sure, you can look this formula up. You can see it. But now it becomes a matter of, OK, so which of those is a proper time? Which of those is the time of the guy watching the spaceship go by? And the, the fortunate thing is almost every textbook uses a notation of that being the proper time. But there's always a panic in my, in my head when I look it up like in front of students. And I forget, oh, crap, which one of those two is the, the proper time? Um, the, the, the reason why I can make it up, though, and again, to be very clear, this is, in fact, the proper time. And the way to make it out, or the way to figure out which is the proper time and which is the observed, and that's what I want to call this the observer's time. Um, because, by the way, this, this will still completely hold if this was an empty spaceship. So it's just a, a, a moving clock on a spaceship. So we only have one observer now, and it's just simply the clock that's moving. So if you think about it like this, there's only really one observer here. The observed time that he sees is going to be some multiple of how many clicks the, um, the guy in the spaceship would see, or simply just that this makes. And so let's just kind of let, let's consider a couple examples here, and let's go from the board on the left. If gamma is, um, we'll say if gamma is, sorry, um, if delta, if theta, is 0 0.9. Now, at 90% speed of light, we know our, our gamma factor is about, I'm just going to call it 2.3. And so clearly what that means is for every second that ticks by on this clock, the observer here will see how many seconds? A little over two. So, so I hope you can kind of uh, read that writing there. But every tick on that moving clock is going to be about two and a half seconds on the, the Earth observer's wristwatch. So literally, what he's going to see is that moving clock is going there. And it's just going tick, 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 instead of tick, 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 or whatever. So he's literally seeing the, the hands on that watch slow down. Isn't that crazy? It, it's not just like an observed effect. In reality, the time that the universe knows about literally runs at different speeds, depending on what how, how fast you're moving through the universe. Um, or, and I should be a little more careful, the relative times between two moving observers do not match, is, is, is really the better way to say that. But universally speaking, time is not a fundamental invariant quantity. And that's really what, what it takes a long time to wrap your head around. And so the whole point of, of going through this here is that no matter what value of gamma you plug in, remember the, the, the only, like the, the, the trivial case is beta of zero. And so the only time we're going to have these two match is when there is no relative motion. And again, that's, that's a dumb case to consider. So no matter any other reference frame that you go into, moving left, moving right, moving any direction, the value of gamma is always going to be greater than one. And so what that means is every other reference frame than this will see this clock slow down. So this clock will run slower in every reference frame than its own. Or the other way to say that is that this, this clock runs fastest in its reference frame. Every single other frame of, of reference in the universe we'll see a slower ticking than what the person on here would, would observe. And that's why the proper time is such a unique thing, that it's the fastest you can measure that clock to be moving. 
every other reference frame, that clock is perceived to run more slowly. Uh, you know, I don't really know a good way to kind of sum that up into words. Um, I was just rewatching exactly what I just said <laughs> and, and write down whatever I said because it made sense to me at the time. Um, again, though, the, the proper time or, or this reference frame is going to be the frame in which you see this clock moving the fastest. So the proper time is always going to be observed to be running fastest. Every other frame will see a, a slower value of that time. Um, and I think that's really all I have to say here. It is a really substantial logical leap, though, from anything you've probably seen before. And that's good, because that's the whole point of the class here.